Thank you, uh, and welcome to uh, today's panel and uh, networking event. Oh, thank, yeah, thank you, you. for coming. Uh, as you probably know, I'm Sim Segal, I'm academic director here of, uh, and founder of the, of the program. Uh, thank you for coming. This is one of the most powerful things you have here at Columbia. Getting first together, being able to network with each other, because you're all super smart and, and select group. And also that we, as Columbia, we can draw some of the best, best minds in enterprise risk management and risk management, get a distinguished panel like we have here today to take time out of their very busy day to tell you what's really going on and to give you some advice and guidance. Uh, so thank you for coming. We have, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bob Kostakopoulos, who's a de Deputy Academic Director, and he's uh, uh, put this panel together with uh, Vanessa's help and Jay's help, so thank you, Vanessa and Jay. And, um, he will be uh, moderating the panel, uh, so he, he will, will, I'll introduce him and he'll come up and, and take it from here, so thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Sim, for the kind remarks and the uh, nice introduction of, uh, to, to the panel. Um, uh, uh, my name is Bob Kastakopoulos, I'm, uh, as Sim said, a Deputy Academic di uh, Director and Lecturer. I'm, I'm honored to uh, moderate this panel. I, um, uh, I'm in awe of this pa panel, the experience that, that they represent. So I will uh, uh, start the introductions. Uh, please uh, curb your enthusiasm uh, till after I finish with the introductions and, uh, so that we can get our panel uh, going. Um, I'll start with uh, Mike, uh, Michael Hennessy. Uh, he's a managing director and CE, COO, chief operating officer, and head of risk for the corporate and institutional solutions organization uh, of uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, Michael has had various, various roles um, uh, within the company. Um, or prior to this role, he had other roles, such as uh, Head of Wealth Management's Operational uh, Risk Activities. Uh, he was the COO of Wealth, Man uh, wealth Management Capital Markets. Uh, and he was the co-head of the integration team that put together uh, the wealth management uh, businesses of uh, uh, Smith Barney and Morgan Stanley. So those of you who have studied mergers, you know that they they're doing the, uh, the, the most difficult job integrating uh, companies. Uh, Michael uh, joined Morgan Stanley from uh, Smith Barney where he was uh, COO of investment products and he headed up insurance, a syndicate and uh, non-discretionary, non-advisory -advi wrap fee program. Uh, prior to uh, Smith Barney, he was uh, focused in the alternative investment space uh, and uh, also spent a decade at Payne Webber. These are all, uh, of course, uh, names uh, that are, you know, very, very important in, in the history of uh, that existed uh, Wall before you guys were born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so or at, at Payne Webber, before you guys were born. That's right. At Payne Webber, he was uh, he was involved in equity research, investment banking, wealth management strategy. And, and, uh, and finally operations. So um, uh, Michael is also uh, on the board of a nonprofit, the New England Science, uh, Science and Sailing F Foundation. Uh, it provides uh, STEM-based uh, educational programs to youth and uh, adults on and off the water. So you have some nice courses on the, on the water, right? Sailing those uh, boats. Uh, he has degrees from Yale and Columbia uh, school, Business School. Um, Erdem uh, Aktug uh, is uh, currently the director team leader at uh, UBS in the investment banking risk methodology model development area. Um, before that, uh, Erdem was, uh, worked at the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank of New York, and he was the um, um, the uh, uh, lead uh, quant uh, of uh, analyst, right, examiner of, uh, in the whole uh, cell credit uh, uh, risk, CCAR, MRM, and Basel exams. Uh, so he examined many of the banks that may be represented here today. Um, 
so in addition to uh, that, um, uh, Erdem has taught at the uh, Baruch uh, College Master of uh, uh, Science uh, uh, Risk Management Program. Uh, he has publications in the area of sovereign risk management, that's country risk, uh, and um, has a PhD in financial economics from Lehigh University, Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. uh, to his, uh, Thank you. Th to his right uh, is Dr. Sven Sandow, uh, who is the global head of credit and operational risk analytics at Morgan Stanley. 20-year uh, career in finance, and before that in physics. Uh, but talking about finance, uh, Sven has worked uh, in various quantitative modeling, um, risk management, and capital management uh, capacities. And um, before that, he worked for uh, Mary Lynch, my alma mater, and, and also Standard & Poor's. Uh, uh, before that, as a, phys uh, as a physicist, he did research at the uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and also the uh, Wiseman Institute uh, of Science. Uh, he has uh, done research in physics, finance, uh, machine learning. He has published in academic journals and he has co-authored a book on learning from data. Uh, so that's a pioneer there for you. Uh, he has a PhD in uh, physics from uh, Martin Luther University, Germany. Um, and, and he is uh, also at Morgan Stanley. Uh, to the far right is... Uh, <laughs> to the far, uh, far right we have uh, uh, John uh, Delacula, mispronounce it a bit. Uh, John currently is the president of DDX Technologies INC. It's a fintech company that uh, is focused on addressing the inefficiencies in the private investment fund industry. Uh, prior to that, uh, John uh, had a career of uh, 20 uh, years in credit risk management. Um, Half of that career was dedicated to counterparty uh, credit risk as global head of uh, hedge fund risk and global head of uh, financial institutions risk management at um, uh, Societe Generale uh, Americas, that's uh, SG Americas. Uh, John's career in risk management also includes position, positions in other financial firms like CIBC, uh, Payne Weber as well, KBC Financial Products. Um, uh, John uh, has a uh, BS in finance from St. John's University. So uh, we can give them a uh, round of applause. <laughs> they, uh, uh, I need to read this, uh, that the views that are expressed uh, are the panelists' own and do not necessarily represent the views of their employers. Or f former employers. Current or former. Or former right. employers. <laughs> He's a former regulator. More important for so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so he doesn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so, um, all right, so, um, uh, the, the first question that I have uh, after we finish with the, our introductions is, to, uh, the question of how important communication skills are in risk management. Um, uh, our program uh, places a great deal of emphasis on that. And uh, so I'll start, uh, Erdem, did you, um, oh, oh, that was Michael, sorry. Um, sure, uh, thanks. Um, I think for those of us who are in this particular business and for you who are going through the studies on this is, is the communications is pretty much your your uh, key skill right after your ability to understand process and analytics because you are standing in between organizations and regulators and others who are keenly interested in your ability to understand risk and their framework that you apply to that understanding and then a first line business. Somewhere down the line is a first line business that you're actually the uh, uh, they, they are your clients, they are your, um, ultimately the, the party that's driving the activity that helps the business grow and 
gives you a place to actually work. And that first line business is not necessarily thinking about risk in the way that you're thinking about risk on a day-to-day -day basis. They're, they don't know the framework, they don't know the concepts, they don't know the, they aren't even necessarily having to deal with the regulators on a day-in and day-out basis. And you are that conduit, you are that party that stands between uh, that whole world and, and them. And for them to help understand what your goals and objectives are and what, how you're there to help them with their business. And then ultimately for you to understand what their business needs are, how the decisions that are made around risk management ultimately impact the commercial nature of their business um, and be able to find that right balance uh, between uh, you know, what you're willing to accept in the way of risk and what you need to be able to mitigate. So at least in my experience, communications is probably the, you know, in the top two or three skills that you need to have. Um, within that construct, it's active listening. It's the ability to um, uh, make sure that all the people involved both understand what it is that you're trying to convey to them, that you're using language and ideas and ways of expressing yourself that are uh, relevant to them and the way that they understand the information, not just necessarily the way that you think about it, but the way that they think about it. Um, and then uh, giving them the opportunity to uh, contribute to whatever the analysis is that you're performing, ultimately the decision or the recommendation that's being made, um, and make sure that they are part of that, that process because they end up having to implement what it is that you guys come up with um, in this process. So uh, without the communication, it, it's really difficult. I think you know, uh, Saba, who's here and one of your teachers, um, hears me say this all the time, our particular business in the form of risk is one that lends itself to language that is not very helpful to the people who are in the business. Lots and lots of use of acronyms. Um, uh, and uh, to the uninitiated, it's a bewildering thing. And you just have to remember that you, know, this, you need to position your, um, your activities in the context that they understand. So that's, that's excellent. Anybody else would like to um, contribute? Uh, uh, yeah, my view would be uh, uh, I would uh, evaluate this in two dimensions. One is when you are presenting something to senior management or uh, regulators or uh, less quantitative audience. I think key is to uh, have a structure uh, in a very simple way. What are we talking about today? or what is this model about, what is it doing. So one thing is simplifying things and to be uh, very clear in your presentations. This is very important because sometimes you don't uh, deal with very quantitative people. Right? So you want to give this message uh, in a very you know, uh, summarized way. Uh, and I, I would say another thing is there is a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, always some uh, um, negotiation or argument between the front office and the back office. Uh, quants ha think very differently. They want to see everything in the data, uh, whereas front office might have a very different view. A lot of things that you don't have the data, they want to have these factors. So one key factor for communication is to be able to be very you know, soft. Uh, don't uh, have very sharp ideas because I cannot tell you how many times I said this is impossible and then after a week I said, oh, we have to do it because in real life these factors are taken into account. So uh, even if you have building a model quantitatively, uh, the real life could be very different from that. So be uh, prepared for different views, uh, which could be uh, the correct view and not yours. Great, thank you. All right, we can move on to the next one then. All right, um, so the next question that we have, and we drew those questions for many uh, discussions that we've had with the uh, uh, students, uh, prior panels, uh, what experience, skills, and tools are necessary for success in your line of work? I think, Ardham, you, you had uh, wanted to talk about that. Uh, yes. Um, I would say this also depends on where you are in the risk management profession. I would uh, divide it into three different categories. Uh, one category would be very quant people, uh, where you would have to use programming, uh, I would say now, nowadays R and Python are very important, but uh, a lot of the banks also use SAS. Uh, I saw also Stata, so uh, you should have profession in one of, if you want to be in this group, you need to be very good at math, uh, very good at programming, uh, understand uh, Black and Scholes, right? this option pricing, how do you drive this, uh, what is a martingale, all of these things you have to be very, uh, 
proficient at uh, if you are, want to be in this quant group. And I think it's uh, easier to find a, a job in this part because it's, I think, could be more difficult than the other two groups. Uh, the second group, I would say, uh, would be middle office. So the first group was, let's say, back office, right, more quant. Second group would be middle office, uh, where they would communicate between the quants and the front office. And uh, they would, let's say, uh, do credit monitoring. So when the bank is lending money, uh, they, they uh, make sure everything is in line. And um, I would say they have some quant background, but they are better knowledgeable at the bank's business and what are day-to-day -day, uh, credit activities, right? So they are more knowledge on that. And then you would have the front office, which is actually doing the job of lending, right? Underwriting these loans, whether to give this loan to this big hedge fund or not, uh, but, and try to understand additional risks. So depending on different dimensions, you might either have need a lot of uh, quant background or very good knowledge of the business, or if you know some people from, you know, uh, these businesses that are borrowing money and you have good connections, then this could also be uh, uh, good for you. So either quant or uh, good information about day-to-day uh, -day risk business or policy, what are the new regulations. So if you don't prefer to be very quant, too much programming, then you have to know either the business or the regulations very well. What are the new regulations that are coming in, uh, like CISL or uh, now we are having also market risk regulations. So it could also be, you could also be very strong in those areas and uh, it could be in high demand. Mm -hmm. I could add a little bit more color from the quant perspective because that's what I'm doing. So I would actually highlight the three skill sets. One is the one that Erlen just managed, right? You need to know math and programming, clearly, right? That's the job. Uh, but you also need to understand the financial instruments and financial markets because otherwise you end up with models, you end up building models that don't make sense, right? So a good quant understands the business as well. And the third one that we just talked about is communication. Uh, clearly very important uh, and for two reasons at least I, I would mention. One is uh, if you build a model, let's say for risk managers, you want to understand from the onset what the risk managers will actually want to do with the, with the model. Because you want to build a model that's fit for purpose and not fit for something else. So that's the listening part that Michael emphasized, right? It goes both ways, actually, communication, right? And the other part, the other way, is the, uh, the ability to explain a model, right? If a risk manager uses a model you build, you want to make sure... Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. You want to make sure that they understand the ideas behind the model, they understand the limitations, that they understand uh, when the model is expected to work or when it's expected to fail. And that would be your job as a quant to be able to explain that. So, so these are the three skills, uh, math, uh, slash modeling, financial products and markets and communication. So these are the three key skills you usually look for when you hire quants. Michael? Uh, just as, as the least numerate person at this table and perhaps this room, um, uh, in the operational risk space, uh, I would say that the key skills are, we already spoke about communication, but process orientation, really thinking about the way that you could possibly lose money in any number of different aspects of your business. And those processes vary by industry, so it, it's really applicable in any industry. You just have to then therefore know your business. So process orientation, knowledge of your business, and a key one here, which I, I think, I'd look to my fellow panelists to, to ratify or not, is lateral thinking. Because if you fail to think laterally about your business and the risks that are involved, you end up always solving for your last loss. And you're not thinking about the loss that you might face in the future. Yeah. An operational risk in our uh, program is uh, responsible for, it is the second largest uh, risk after strate uh, strategic risk. Uh, so it's a very important uh, opera I mean, a risk uh, to consider. John, did you uh, yeah, and I, I would just add to what Michael said. Um, in terms of thinking laterally, it's very important to understand the business and understand what the interdependencies are across uh, the various stripes of, of operations. So, um, you know, for example, uh, as, a, as a credit risk manager, uh, I would like to uh, understand um, what it is that my market risk counterparts are, are interested in and, and, and vice versa, as well as from an operational perspective, 
I'm a user of, uh, of a lot of information that comes from uh, back office or middle office, uh, but how can, um, you know, ha I want to make sure that they understand um, what my dependencies are on that or what, what credits dep uh, dependencies are on that. So it's very important to maintain that communication and understand uh, basically uh, all sides of, of your business. So because if they feed you bad information, then your uh, analysis is not going to be all that well, great. Yeah. So it, it's uh, excellent points. Um, in terms of um, what value does ZRM bring to an organization, and uh, how valuable is ZRM, uh, let's say, uh, to a systemically important uh, financial institution? John? Yeah, so um, just uh, carrying from what I was just uh, mentioning, um, so ERM, I mean, the first order of value that's brought is, is the, the standards uh, and the, the common taxonomy that, that is created through the uh, uh, enterprise risk management. Uh, traditionally, you know, when we think of risk management, uh, you know, market risk, uh, credit risk, operational risk, uh, these are effectively silos, and you know when I started in in in, in risk management, um, uh, frankly, I didn't even really need to converse or exchange information with my counterparts in the other stripes. What enterprise the, the value that enterprise risk management brings is in the fact that um, they now now are amalgamating um, all of these uh, various stripes and and creating a common language. And that's very important also because, um, you know, ERM is sitting between uh, the, the, the stripes or the, the various uh, types of uh, risk management, but and also to the executive committee and the board. And to be able to reduce and simplify the, uh, the language of risk, which is already complex, and particularly in a large uh, financial institution, um, this is this is absolutely critical. And for uh, for a, uh, a systemically important financial institution, you know, uh, this is uh, making sure that uh, we're enforcing, uh, fortifying the the resiliency of the ecosystem. I mean, we don't we we, we don't want uh, the regulators certainly don't want there to be any disruption uh, amongst these very important institutions uh, for the. Uh, economy and for society. Michael? No, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Ms. Van, did you? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I would just add a bit uh, regard to the role of ERM or risk management more, more generally. There is the setting of standards, that's the risk monitoring. It's also an advisory role to the businesses, uh, advice with regard to risk. So these are important roles that. that enhance the stability of the organization. One more, one more aspect of value, if I may. Uh, so if, if this were a public company uh, and uh, it is a uh, listed stock, right? so the fact that and we see here, um, I think a mention of it, it's, it's um, uh, providing um, an integrated picture of upside and downside enterprise volatility. Right? It's a very important because think of that as a, as a share price. What, oh, what the enterprise risk management, management framework is doing is it's creating um, an alignment between uh, risk management and the business strategy and ensuring, to the best of the resources uh, allowed, that uh, the you know the board will set what that what that uh, risk man what risk appetite is, and if you can stabilize the volatility of the performance of the of the firm, that increases shareholder value. So to put it tangibly. Yeah. So the Miller Modigliani theorem doesn't hold. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now in, in conjunction with that question, where do you think the job opportunities are in the ERM risk uh, area in, in the industry? I'll, I'll just, uh, before that, I'll just add to the value of ERM. Um, I think firms, uh, the way I see it, they, their uh, major uh, uh, motivation is profit maximization, right? The, the revenue generation is the most important thing. So front office people, 
uh, are on you know, more in demand uh, or they make higher salaries. Uh, but uh, because of the regulation, uh, the firms now uh, have to be very careful about uh, their capital requirement. Because of regulation, they might have to keep more uh, capital, right? If they have to keep more capital, then uh, they will be able to lend less. And this will also affect the profit again, right? So I even if they are profit maximization now, now they have a constraint. If they have problem with regulation, they will not be able to maximize profit. So that kind of brings the value to ERM. Uh, and also, if you are paying attention to news, uh, if there's a big issue that is uncovered, uh, let's say uh, uh, the Deutsche Bank is having some issues now generally, uh, or a couple of years ago it was Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. that they had, uh, this was in the public news, that some fake bank accounts were created. So whenever these type of issues are uncovered, then the regulators, they, they will first pay a lot of big fines. So that's the value if you don't manage this, then you might pay big fines, and uh, regulation will evolve according to that, right? If we uncovered some issues according to this ABC, then regulators will say, oh, we don't have good regulation here, so you probably will, s you, and you are seeing more uh, compliance exam or operational risk related exams become more important. So uh, bringing it to the question, what are the import, which, which risks are important, uh, where are important uh, Parts. So wherever you, is a prob you see a problem that is on the news, then it's more likely that you will find a job there. So operational risk, <laughs> because uh, I would say one of the top Fed uh, uh, re persons who retired, she, she actually moved to West Fargo because West Fargo had a lot of issues and they want to be you know, compliant with regulation. Uh, and Deutsche Bank also hired a lot of, uh, this is I think depending on what you need, uh, or what the problem is, banks will pay more attention to this. So because of London Whale that happened, right, this was related to mostly market risk, operational risk, you had the new regulations. So I would say uh, operational risk is important now. Uh, market risk is important because of new regulations that are coming in. Uh, fundamental review of trading book, book, FRTB, this is uh, coming in the next few years. Uh, and then you have CISL now, this is related to reserves, how much reserves you should keep. Uh, more related to maybe liquidity, but you will see a lot of postings about that. That also affects capital. So I would say, uh, obviously the most important risk for me, uh, I deal with that, which is credit risk, but a lot of things are done in this field. A lot of discoveries, inventions, models, everybody uh, accepts these models. There is not too much changes, foreseen changes. But in market risk or operational risk, uh, it's like some more discoveries to be made, it looks like. And uh, then there you might find uh, better opportunities. Yeah, I, I would agree with this, these statements, right? So all, all of these risk stripes are important and, and remain to be important for, for some time to come. They, they differ in terms of their maturity, credit risk, as you pointed out. Uh, it's quite mature, many of the approaches are there. Still a lot of work to be done, but it is mature. Operational risk is less mature, plus it's dealing with uh, a lot of things that are constantly changing, like cyber risk, right? The methodology, uh, technologies are changing yeah. rapidly, so risk management has to adapt. So there's probably more flow there, but uh, in all risk areas, there's, there's work to be done. And in all of those risk areas, there's an increased focus, and not surprisingly, uh, on data. Uh, so mm -hmm. people who can deal with data, understand with data, uh, and can make sense of data, uh, will, will be useful in, in many, many areas. So that's, a, that's a, I think, a, a common theme. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in, well, this is a, a fun question. <laughs> Right. What is particularly uh, rewarding about your job? <laughs> uh, getting a glass of water here. No, no, thank you. No. But I can take a step at that. Yeah, yeah. please do. So I, I, I would, I mean, for me personally, I would point to, uh, to, to three things. Uh, first is uh, being part of a business that adds value to economy, contribute to that. I think that's that's very rewarding, right? No matter what you do, right? Uh, the second thing I would point to is the intellectual challenge. So a job uh, in risk management or many other jobs in finance, uh, 
they're constant intellectual challenges, right? It could be understanding a market, understanding a product, uh, building a model for something, understanding an organization, how it functions. So uh, a long list of intellectual challenges. I, I personally find it very rewarding. And uh, the third thing I would point to is uh, the, the people we work with, right? So it's uh, similar to uh, things when I look around here and in, in this room. And in the industry, we have uh, it's a it's a very diverse group of people that come from from many different countries, have many educational backgrounds, and, uh, many many different views on, on perspectives on things. So, working on a daily basis with such a group of people, I find that very enjoyable. So these are three things I'm going to. So it's a fun profession, right? You you deal with uh, uh, with problems with people. And uh, people are happy when you solve uh, problems. Uh, people are not very happy when you criticize them in the way that you uh, present your findings. But this is where the communication skills, skills come, come in, right? Because you don't want to criticize. You want to be soft on people and hard on problems, right? That's, that's the... Uh, anybody else would like to... Um I think the most rewarding part of uh, uh, my job is the, uh, the bonus. No. <laughs> uh, just a joke. Okay. Disclaimer. I was say the disclaimer. I really love the politics. The politics. <laughs> no, I, I think Sven hit it on the nose. Um, it, you know, it's it's uh, it's the people you work with. A lot of smart people, and it's the opportunity to learn because you're working in a space, yeah. at least in our industry, uh, that's constantly evolving, constantly changing. The, the risk profile of everything you're dealing with is changing as well, um, and. It kind of goes back to the prior comments about different risk stripes and their relative level of maturity. Um, you know, there, there's room to evolve the science behind all of this uh, in every risk stripe that we've got. So it, it's, a, it's an area of exploration um, and a discovery in terms of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, I agree. Uh, jokes aside, uh, it's a lot of learning. You learn about uh, the industry very well, the uh, real life cases, uh, the front office, how they are landing, or middle office, what are the challenges they have. You communicate with uh, the underwriters right, or regulators. So uh, every day is uh, a learning uh, process. And uh, I participated, now I'm in model development, but also when I was at the Fed, I participated a lot of exams, validation. So uh, I would say thanks depend. Thanks for that, by the way. Thanks. Well, Thank, thanks for that time. Which, which As a recipient of those exams. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, I would say uh, depending on. So it, uh, I used to be in the Basel exams. Uh, now Basel is not that important. CCAR is more important, for example, or MRM, model risk exams, more important. I would say ev whether you do validation or development, there is a lot of things. There are a lot of things to learn. And when you are looking for jobs, uh, you also have to be aware what is development. Usually it's uh, creating a new model. Uh, what is validation? It's mostly reviewing models. And then you have audit, it could also be audit. Then you are reviewing everything, whether it the governance or all other aspects, procedures follow. So it could be, you could be in different groups uh, and you can learn a lot. So you should also be knowledgeable about different groups though in this. But the most important part is, uh, I think to me, uh, because before I was academics, I was like a assistant professor of finance. Now it's more real life, more challenge. You learn real things, uh, real, real landing, how it's happening. I think that's the best part. Yeah, I would, I would just, uh, first I, I agree with uh, everything that my, my fellow panelists are saying. I would add um, that in my career, uh, risk, was uh, in the beginning uh, thought of as uh, the you know a defensive position. Uh, we would be uh, figuring out figuring out ways that always figuring out ways that things could go wrong. Uh, the glass is always uh, half empty. In some cases, it's shattered on the floor. Um, but today, uh, risk is now. Uh, more a, a partner to the business uh, and a promoter of the strategy in a controlled way. And so it's very, um, it's very gratifying to know that as a risk professional, I'm now uh, part of the growth uh, and the success story of, of the firm. 
Well, a few years ago, Sim uh, wrote a book, uh, Corporate Value of uh, ERM, uh, where basically he propounded the ideas that, that, that we are uh, talking about today, uh, that uh, uh, risk now is uh, a necessary part of uh, uh, valuing a strategy. Uh, you cannot uh, decide to do something before you, you uh, stress test the risks associated with a strategy. strategy. But we, we haven't talked about uh, strategic risk. We mentioned about operational risk uh, in, in our industry. But strategic risk uh, doesn't enter uh, the equation, or does it, in, in your experience? Um, uh, it, it certainly does enter in the equation. Um, if for no other reason than the Fed is interested in it, uh, it, it's part of a body of work that they've been focusing on for the last 18 months at least in terms of uh, proposed approaches towards strategic risk and what they want to see from firms like ours uh, and the way that we think about strategic risk. So uh, it's um, it, at the end of the day, your strategic risks and, and your ability to implement against your strategy drive your ability to drive growth because that's what your strategy usually focuses on. And it also helps manage expectations of your shareholders and others. So um, it's, it's a, you know, an important and frankly growing stripe within our industry, at least in my experience. Well, that's... Uh, I, I would say that, um, so as far as, so enterprise risk management um, embodies a, a, a discipline, a structure, and um, peripheral to the, to the risk uh, committees, Risk is also uh, an important part, and I'm just speaking from, the, from my experience in banking, um, an important part of evaluating and effectively challenging the strategic planning of, uh, of the bank. So what, what winds up happening is the executive committee is reviewing uh, each business line strategy in terms of uh, revenues that they expect, the risks that they, uh, they, they expect to take, the capital resources that they would require. Um, and risk is there. Risk is, is present during that. So um, we're part and parcel to the build out of the strategy from, a, from the perspective of um, effective challenge as a partner. Okay, um, do's and do, uh, don'ts uh, in career advancement. Uh, Zvan? Okay, so <coughs> let me start with, idea a, there. with a couple of points. I mean, there are many, but uh, start with the do's. Actually, I've talked mainly about the do's. Uh, well, the, the, the first one is obvious. Uh, do high quality work. That's an obvious one, right? Be part of the team, contribute to the team, to the firm you're working for. Uh, the second one, uh, probably also obvious, but it's important to keep that one in mind, is uh, always make an effort to, to keep learning. And there are, there are different channels uh, for which that can happen. One is the traditional way, uh, read books, read articles. And uh, the other one that's important, uh, very useful, is uh, learn from your colleagues. Uh, ask your colleagues, what are you working on? What's the context? Uh, what problem are you trying to solve? How are you solving that problem? So usually you find colleagues who are happy to, to, to talk to you. And that's where I learn the stuff that you don't find in the textbooks. Uh, also, uh, ask your manager questions, right? If your manager wants you to do some analysis, ask the question, what are we doing with this analysis? What's the context? How does it fit into business? What are the consequences? Get, get that context. And this is, uh, I found, very, very valuable, and it doesn't even take a look that much time often, but it's important to keep that in mind, and that's that's important for for, for your progress, that, that, that learning. And uh, another thing, well, I would mention two more things. One is uh, build a professional network within the firm and without the firm. Uh, it's very important for support, it's very important for information flow, you learn that way as well. And uh, the last thing I would say, uh, always try to have a job that has uh, some content that you actually enjoy, mm. right? It will never be 100%, but there are many jobs out there that have a sizable chunk that is enjoyable, and strive to find something like that. Uh, if you feel you're not at that place, then 
talk to your manager if you can do something else, or if that doesn't work, find another job. But I think it's important to to be able to put your heart in your job, to enjoy it. Uh, otherwise, well, you won't be happy, <laughs> and you probably won't be that successful. So these are, I think, the, the main the main do's that 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 I always keep in mind. Uh, people start a career, even for myself, it's, it's still the same thing at any point of your career. And the don'ts is, well, you know, don't forget, forget about to, the to do's, right? It's just the flip side of that. It's as simple as that, I would say. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's really very, uh, very useful uh, and helpful. Anybody else wants to? Uh... Uh, yes, I would say I, I agree uh, with the comments. Um, I would say try to build a good relationship with your uh, direct line manager because this will affect your advancement uh, and make sure you feel good about your job. And if you don't have a good relationship and you don't feel good about it, so try, uh, uh, try to find something else or try to find some other task. This is important if you don't feel like you're advancing. Don't waste your time too much uh, just getting angry and unhappy. Uh, don't, uh, I would say in the meetings, try to be very careful, especially when you have uh, higher management. Uh, you don't want to make it too many jokes or talk too much. You want to be very careful uh, in a general setting. Uh, I'm telling you because of my experience, right? <laughs> so uh, you are the most one of the most junior members, and you want to be very careful about what you say or do in a general meeting, right? Uh, this will, you know, they want to see you want to be serious in general and be prepared in the meetings. Uh, uh, you don't want to say I don't. If you are asked a question, you don't want to say I don't remember this. If it's especially if it's your model, you are doing something, and they ask you some detail about this model, and you don't remember that, you know, that's also not good. So in general meetings, you should know everything in and out about your model. Right? You have to be very prepared to even uh, you know, simple questions or even detailed questions. You know, what is the exposure to this portfolio? You know, what is this you know, stressed exposure? Or uh, why are we using this model in instead of another model? So these type of things, I would say, in a meeting, you have to be ready. Uh, other don't, uh, I don't know, maybe if you have happy hour or those type of things, uh, we don't get too drunk. So this is another <laughs> uh, You want to be professional. Uh, remember, professional in your work, even if you are a party animal. Right? You don't want to do this at work. You want to be very, uh, all in all the time, you, during the work or in happy hour, you want to create this impression of you know very good, nice person, very proper person. Okay, But this is also don't uh, as well, advice. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, don't get drunk. I wish somebody had said that to me when I was starting out, actually. I have a funny story about that. Um, I won't tell the funny story, but I will say, don't have more than two drinks at a work function, ever. Um, uh, yeah, I would just, I would say a, a two, two or three quick things here. The first one is, is um, the most valuable asset that you have is your credibility, and don't trade that away. Mm -hmm. So do not lie, do not hedge the truth, do not fake something. If you don't know it, say it. Um, uh, the other two things I'd say is that, and this is gonna sound all too familiar to Saba, but um, uh, know the five to 10 things that are important to you. The, the, the things that you want to get out of your career and the job that you're in right now. And those five to 10 things evolve over time. What's important to you right now, this minute, will be different in 10 years time or 15 years time. So check yourself every now and then, know what those five to 10 things are. My five to 10 things are different than your, than your five to 10 things. But if you have those clearly defined for yourself, you'll be able to measure your satisfaction with your current role. And you'll also be able to measure how other roles that you might see might do a better or worse job at it. You can make more objective decisions about careers when you're having something to benchmark yourself against. And then finally, the, uh, the other thing I'd say is a career is like driving down a four lane freeway. We all wanna be in the left lane, foot on the pedal, flying down the road to whatever destination we're aimed at with no traffic in front of us, it never works that way. You gotta be prepared for changing lanes, you gotta be prepared for sometimes traffic in front of you, you gotta be prepared to sometimes take the bypass road because it might be faster than the freeway. So think about your career as a dynamic thing. You're the one that's driving the car. No one else is gonna get you there but yourself, so. That's really very, uh, very, very uh, profound uh, advice. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists. Uh, John, do you wanna say something? Uh, yeah, I, I would just, uh, again, echoing, uh, so always maintain a, um, a learning curve. Stay, uh, stay curious. 
And um, selfishly, I, I would say that, you know, having uh, gone through several stressful periods, several business cycles, um, it's really refreshing when I have, when or we would have people in our department who maintain uh, enthusiasm, uh, positive energy. Um, that always, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it works in, in everything. But um, stay curious, stay positive, always try to find, uh, always try to help. Great, great yeah. advice. Um, I think uh, we have time for our lightning round uh, question, hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, briefly, what are uh, one to three key areas in ERM? or risk in general that you would like to uh, emphasize and for, for our students to uh, take uh, away from the panel. Um. Uh, maybe I'll start. I, I, I would emphasize, you know, with everything that's been uh, the, um, mentioned today on the panel, um, but I would emphasize n that in reality, while uh, ERM creates a very good discipline, a very good structure and uh, has raised the awareness to risks that were not thought of uh, previously. Uh, cybersecurity, strategic risk, uh, fraud risk, reputational risk. Um, that's great that we've, we've uncovered all of these things and we have this discipline. But in reality, it will change. And so don't be complacent, um, uh, emphasizing that uh, what we know uh, today and what we've seen in the past uh, may not be and probably will not be what we see in the future, particularly in, in this day and age with um, geopolitical uh, concerns. Uh, I mentioned, we men mentioned cyber uh, risk. Um, I saw a, uh, a stat um, uh, last year that so uh, my former firm and, and banks generally were experiencing o over 20,000 cyber attacks per day. Right. So, th this is a new is a new uh, world, and it continues to change. So don't uh, don't be complacent. Yeah, I would I would echo that point. Right, things are always changing. Be open minded. Uh, always learn new things, and uh, keep your eyes open. Uh, areas that uh, people think about a lot these days are uh, cyber risk. You mentioned that right for the obvious reason. That's a fascinating one because the technology changes day to day, right? So it's a it's a basically an arms race between uh, organizations like our banks and the hackers, right? So constantly changing. Other things, other areas people are focused on right now, again that, that keeps changing. Another area is uh, pure party risk, as technology keeps uh, changing, gets more and more complex. Uh, banks use more and more external technology providers and since their software is getting more complex then the risk is more complex and higher right so there's a lot of focus on, on third party risk so these are two areas that come to my mind that people talk about a lot today but that will be very different probably in five years from now <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, looking at the last 10 years uh, uh, there were a lot of regulations uh, coming after you know, the crisis the mortgage crisis, right? You had that Frank Act, Basel regulation strengthened. So banks, uh, all the banks and rating agencies, you cannot rely on these ratings anymore. You have to create your own ratings. Uh, so all the banks uh, are ba are basically created their own risk departments, and they hired a lot of people uh, from academics, PhD, you know, engineers. Uh, from 2000, I would say 2010 to 2017, 18. But now I see this a little bit kind of. Uh, mature, matured, so this kind of all the departments are now, I would say, on full capacity. So uh, unfortunately, we are kind of uh, saturated, and I think some deregulation is coming. So uh, I, my advice would be uh, not always look into the banks to find risk uh, management jobs. Right? Banks mostly kind of set up their departments, and maybe they will have 10% of their workforce they will hire. But it's not going to be like 2010-15, they, where every year they doubled up their departments. So there is some maturation there, saturation there. But also think about not the banks, but maybe insurance. Uh, who knows? A lot of there are a lot of hedge funds also. Have you heard of Bridgewater? Have you heard of Two Sigma? These type of names. So uh, 
I see a lot of uh, risk management activity going on, uh, not just in the banks, but also in the shadow banking, like BlackRock or hedge funds or mutual funds so, or insurance. So also keep an eye on where you can fit into, uh, into these uh, uh, jobs and also that might also open some doors for you. So that would be my advice uh, in terms of the job search. Yep. Um, I'll go with two things. First one is, is uh, just remember, no matter how fancy the framework or how sophisticated the tool or how great the knowledge, that our job at the end of the day and risk is to avoid loss. And you can measure your success by the losses in an organization. And in that same regard, you know, a good manager is driving revenue in the front line or, th or the first line, but they're also driving profit. And in fact, that's probably even more important in many respects because when you can't control the top line because of economic conditions or otherwise, you're having to control the bottom line through expense management. And you can work all day long to drive a dollar revenue and maybe 30 cents of it goes to the bottom line if you're really good at your job. If you work all day long and save a dollar of loss, all of that goes to the bottom line. So it's a, it's a powerful way for a first line manager who's thinking about profit to think about this role in the organization. Um, the, the, uh, other key takeaway in, in terms of what I think of about emerging risk, data use. Mm. Your CEO sitting in front of a congressional panel is a risk. And I can promise you it's a risk that they are not going to enjoy if they actually have to realize it. And you can see in the world around us that monetization of data is a huge, huge part of our economy now. And that's not just with financial services. It's with with every business that's out there at this point. Everybody's trying to figure out how to collect the data so they can monetize the data. And the appropriate use of that data and the controls that you have around that use of data, I think, you know, cyber, cyber feels so, I don't know, early teens to me, um, maybe mid-teens. I think data use is, is probably one that, that merits a lot more focus and attention and will continue to grow, particularly as you look at GDPR and what the Europeans have in the available toolkit to find the living bejesus out of you. So um, if people are looking at a frontier in risk, that to me is one to think about. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, and a applause for our panelists.